This evening, I want to look at a few passages in the book of Philippians, chapter 4, uh, really kind of centering on really a great statement of encouragement that should be uh, very uplifting for us and to give us hope uh, when we have major challenges in front of us as uh, we are all having a variety of those from time to time. It seems like there is no end to uh, the challenges and the difficulties that life face, uh, life brings to us and we're faced with and uh, can be somewhat daunting at times. And there's this very encouraging statement that Paul was trying to uplift other brethren at Philippi with. It was, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. And so there should be this overwhelming sense of encouragement that we receive when we realize while there is no shortage to challenges and difficulties, the scriptures are telling us that with Christ there is no end and there is no shortage of what we are able to accomplish and continue to thrive and overcome through Him. And uh, But in order to practically do this, that's, that's the key. How do, how do I practically uh, actually uh, engage in in a way spiritually with my Lord and with uh, the spiritual powers that are in heaven uh, through Jesus Christ? Uh, how do I engage practically in a way that allows me uh, to be able to see this uh, really accomplished in my life? I think sometimes we're, we're faced with that where it's one thing to believe it and to be kind of built up and and uh, to get that, that zeal going, uh, but then sometimes maybe let down if you feel like, I just don't feel like practically anything that I'm trying is really working. And so, I uh, want to kind of uh, borrow the expression that uh, sometimes I've uh, heard different people use with smartphones. They have apps for almost everything. There's an app for that. Uh, it's common to say. There's no end to things. Uh, actually, I was kind of interested when I was in, uh, when I was in Morgantown, I, I got to uh, visit with some old friends. I was talking to the mother of a friend of mine that I had grown up, known for many years. And uh, he went on to become a developer and apparently developed an app uh, that allows you to communicate with restaurants so you can touch base and let them know what time you're coming and uh, cut down on your wait time. I guess he ended up sold it, selling it for several millions of dollars and uh, it was kind of amazing that th some of the, <laughs> the things that are out there, people are really tapping into that. This business is just booming and growing with technology and really there almost is no end to apps that make our lives a little bit easier. And, uh, and so I want to just kind of borrow that expression and kind of use that application of maybe looking at our life in a way of uh, kind of spiritually tapping into the technology that God provides to you and I. And to maybe download, if you will, some things that Paul says are available for us, uh, kind of at our spiritual app store, uh, the scriptures. <laughs> There's plenty of apps for, for what we need practically uh, to uh, see this a reality in our life. But I want to look at Philippians chapter 4 and read verses 4 through 9 and basically see there's going to be three apps and uh, they all start with the letter P and just as we read, see if you can identify and note those and we'll kind of look at all three tonight. Philippians chapter 4, beginning in verse 1, says, Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I will say rejoice. Let your gentle spirit be known to all men. The Lord is near. Be anxious for nothing, but in everything, by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all comprehension, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Finally, brethren, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is right, whatever is pure, Whatever is lovely, whatever is of good repute, if there is any excellence, and if anything worthy of praise, dwell on these things. The things you have learned and received and heard and seen in me, practice these things, and the God of peace will be with you. Now he tells us practically, here are some practical things he wants you and I to get used to being kind of a, having a habit of engaging in. What is the result of this? Result, as he goes on, he talks about being content in his life, is verse 13. I can do all things through him who strengthens me. Can do all things. And as I just want to very briefly go over those three uh, letter P apps here in our, our app store in Philippians. It says we need to pray. It says we must 
pray, I want to specifically talk about a manner that we pray. We're going to talk a little bit about that, but specifically we need to pray with thankfulness. And he also says that we need to think or ponder. This is going to be also very, very crucial to the way that we pray. He says we pray with thankfulness. We also have to pray in a way in which we ponder or reflect or meditate. And then the third is then go ahead and practice. Practice these things. Or go ahead and once your faith is now in gear, it's engaged, now get to work. Go ahead and do what it is uh, that you are faced with an obstacle and you are trying to get through it, around it. Uh, on the other side, walk, move forward, keep going, engage, now you're ready. And I just want to uh, just kind of briefly just go over these things and just find that really just kind of practical things. Maybe we, we know these things, but it's good to be reminded about them and uh, just kind of give us courage um, when we need to overcome these obstacles. But let's just talk about that first one, pray. How important it is that we remember to pray. I think it, it, it's, it's something that's come in my mind, just how frequently it seems that I, myself, I, I tend to do this. I tend to be one of, I want to be in a hurry with everything. Uh, not, not only w with a hurry with, with getting the answers, but even sometimes with, with knowledge. Um, you know, just that passage alone. You know, whenever we're searching for some passage that gives us some, some courage, some passage that gives us hope, here's a great passage. I can do all things. Well, that's awesome. God, God tells me nothing's impossible. I can go ahead and do it. And if I'm not careful, I don't actually think about practically what I need to do. I'll go ahead and just start acting, start engaging, and again, fall flat on my face and wonder, why is this not working? Uh, why am I not getting it? Why am I just spinning my, my wheels? And as we've studied in the Old Testament, uh, in our adult class on Wednesday nights, it's been a great reminder that David was one who learned this. How sometimes he was such a hurry to try to get the answer, such a hurry to try to just act, such a hurry. And how many times he forgot to pray. When he would pray, when he would consult God, things would be much better. But turn over to Luke chapter 18, and Jesus constantly taught about prayer, constantly uh, and, and, uh, encouraged us to put our faith and really never ever letting any situation go by without praying about it. Everything's prayer worthy. Everything needs prayer to be able to be accomplished in the way God uh, fits us to do so. In Luke chapter 18 verse 1 it says, Now he was telling them a parable to show that at all times they ought to pray and not to lose heart. Not sometimes, not just for those huge uh, impossible problems, but at all times. Time. We are to get into the practice, to be in the, uh, the habit of praying about everything. Whether they be great, uh, enormous obstacles or sometimes even that annoying pebble that seems to be uh, lurking around maybe in your shoe that just seems to be annoying and you just uh, need, need to get rid of it. <coughs> sometimes the small annoyances are prayer worthy. Sometimes we forget about that. Sometimes even the small irritating things of life are worthy to go to God and tell him to seek his wisdom, seek his advice, seek his counsel. And he gives us illustration in verse 2. He says, In a certain city there was a judge who did not fear God and did not respect man. There was a widow in that city, and she kept coming to him, saying, Give me legal protection from my opponent. For a while he was unwilling, but afterward he said to himself, Even though I do not fear God nor respect man, yet because this widow bothers me, I will give her legal protection. Otherwise, by continually coming, she will wear me out. They're going to give this humorous illustration. Up here's this, this poor widow, and she is just absolutely determined. She is not leaving until she gets help. And she knows if she kind of pesters him enough, she knows, he, he, even though he said no a couple times, she knows he's going to be so uh, just ready to get rid of me that finally he's going to cave in and he's going to answer my problem. And he uses this kind of humorous illustration to tell us certainly God is nothing like this. <laughs> God is never annoyed with us. God is never, just Daniel, quit bothering me here. Here's, your, here's the answer to your problem. Now stop talking to me. He would never, ever say that to any of us. He beckons, please, let's come to me. And what he says is, if this widow got her way through this persistent way of constantly refusing to let go of it, constantly talking about it, and, 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 and coming upon him saying, I need your help, it says we ought to have faith and confidence that God is alarmed, God is aware God is seriously involved with all the things going on in our lives. He is bothered by these things, just as we are. 
And He wants us to go to Him. He wants us to pray about these things. And that's what He says in verse 6. And the Lord said, Hear what the unrighteous judge said. Now will not God bring about justice for His elect who cry to Him day and night? And will He delay long over them? And here's again where I, I often need that lesson of it's one thing to remember to pray, but to be persistent. He said that was the lesson that we ought always to pray. Don't stop. Continue engaging in it. And another great lesson, and I, I love to always uh, think about this. It's, it's a great source of encouragement for me about just having confidence of God's abilities uh, when I do engage in prayer. And how much further along I can get is over in uh, John chapter 6 for the feeding of the, the 5,000. Uh, I, I was think it's so interesting how Jesus turns to his disciples and says, go ahead and handle this problem. And of course, uh, once it, uh, they kind of take inventory of what they could possibly do to fix it, uh, they're left down with five loaves of bread and two fish, and Jesus takes those and feeds the multitudes. I always find it interesting, this lesson is given uh, twice. Almost the exact lesson, just different numbers. Uh, I want to get another cake, you have 4,000. And it's a different number of loaves and different number of fish. But the same lesson is given. And I've often wondered, perhaps the reason why Jesus wanted to give this particular illustration, this particular miracle several times is because practically they were going to have to use this. Specifically, remember how many, how many were baptized in the day of Pentecost? Was it 3,000? And you've got 12 rookie preachers who now have to teach and preach and encourage and feed, as Jesus said to Peter, feed my lambs. And then what happened? Not just a few moments later after Peter works a great miracle, Peter and John, and they cause a lame man to be healed. And so many people were inspired by it. What did the number come to? And the number came to be about 5,000. How are 12 rookie preachers supposed to take care of a congregation of 5,000 people? I, I get nervous thinking in front of 60. <laughs> and that's, 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 it's hard. I cannot imagine. You're up there preaching and teaching. you got 11 other guys helping you out. And you have to attend to the spiritual needs of 5,000 people. How? What were the two lessons, Jesus? With three, four thousand and five thousand? Go to God. Rely upon Him. Stop relying on yourself. God is there. I can do all things through Him. Practically, how? Rely on prayer. Rely on prayer. And a very specific way that we are to pray. Notice, go back over to our, our app store in Philippians. And there is a very specific way he tells us to pray that makes all the difference in the world. He says something that we will truly uh, enhance our ability to rely upon this in a more effective way. Philippians chapter 4, verse 4 says, Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I will say rejoice. Let your gentle spirit be known to all men. The Lord is near. Be anxious for nothing, but in everything by prayer and what? And supplication with thanksgiving. Let your requests be made known to God. So there's something else that we need to do when we're praying for the situation that is at hand. And that is He wants us to kind of go through a review of all the times God has answered previous situations. One of the cool things about uh, smartphones is when they have that function when you take a picture and sometimes it comes in handy, maybe you kind of scroll through the number of pictures you've got stored on there and actually your GPS kind of acts, it tells you where you were. And uh, so I think this is kind of a neat feature. Uh, you kind of remember, oh yeah, I remember where I was, I remember the situation, I remember the events of that day, and all of a sudden it becomes very vivid in your mind, kind of enhancing even that picture itself. Well, this is what Paul is saying we need to do as we download this app. We need to also use another feature spiritually, which is recall upon our remembrance kind of the GPS of all the times God showed up. Kind of all those moments. You guess what's going to do? Your, your, your kind of a phone is going to be flooded with just all these places where you remember, I, I remember God helped me over here. And I remember this other occasion when, when I, was, I was deeply distressed, I was depressed, I was 
anxious and, and I did. I, I, I went to God and, and He helped me, brought me through this. And when we're bringing thanksgiving, we're bringing attention. And what is also happening is we become to magnify. We begun to magnify and we start thinking. And that's, remember the second thing he said to do? We need to pray with thanksgiving and we need to pray pondering. In verse 8, finally, brethren, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is of good repute, if there is any excellence and if anything worthy of praise, dwell on these things. And here's the part where I need to slow down. I, I, I need to do a lot of things. You know, uh, I, I need to slow down uh, in, in just really everything, everything in life. I, I just my mind sometimes just wants to engage. I just want to quickly start moving. Patience is a hard thing to remember to learn. You need to slow down a lot of times. And here's what he's saying: it's so effective for a prayer life. Don't feel the need to start acting right away. Take a moment. Stop in a reflection. <coughs> Stop. And in our thanksgiving for all the previous times God has helped, let's praise God. Because what we're going to be doing is we're going to start magnifying Him. When we stop in our prayer and we offer thanksgiving of all the previous times God has shown up, and then we start pondering, you know what happens? God's power gets bigger than the problem. We magnify the power of the Lord and the problem becomes much bigger more insignificant. And Psalm 69 verse 30, he says, I will praise the name of God with song and magnify Him with thanksgiving. When we pray in this way, we are enlarging and we are pondering and we are reflecting and what is happening is it is dwarfing the monumental task that seems so hard and so difficult and God becomes become more supreme than this. Again, uh, in Psalm 34, verse 3, it says, Oh, magnify the Lord with me, and let us exalt His name together. That word again, magnify. Let us make Him larger and, and, and broader in our minds. And when we are done this, now we are able to practice. Now we are able to actually engage. Only now are we able to start putting things into motion. Let's go back there again to Philippians chapter chapter 4, and I want to read a, a specific application of this. Philippians chapter 4, verse 4, again says, Rejoice in the Lord always. Again I will say rejoice. Let your gentle spirit be known to all men. The Lord is near. Be anxious for nothing. But in everything by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God, and the peace of God which surpasses all comprehension will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. In other words, your mind will start to become less anxious as you are reflecting, as you are giving thanks to God for previous occasions where He has come to rescue you, to save you, and to help you. And in verse 8, as you begin pondering on this, God and His power begins to become so magnified that it is so much easier for us to then actually walk across the water or, or go across the wall or whatever it is that we need to do in accomplishing that obstacle. But verse 8, he says, Finally, brethren, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is of good repute, if there is any excellence and if anything worthy of praise, and I can't think of anything more worthy of praise than exalting and magnifying the name of the God who accomplishes the impossible on a regular, consistent basis. In verse 9 it says, The things you have learned and received and heard and seen in me, practice these things, and the God of peace will be with you. Now the key is that we have to have all three. All three have to be engaged, and really in many ways has to be in this order. We get ourselves in a lot of trouble when we begin to increase our knowledge. We start thinking about all the things that... that uh, God is telling us He's able to do. And we go ahead and we start practicing before we pray and ponder. I want to see an example where the disciples had to learn this lesson over in Luke chapter 18. And maybe this is familiar to you in many ways where, again, you, you maybe come across a great verse, a great statement of God reminding you of His power, reminding us of His ability and we get in such a hurry to go ahead and engage and it doesn't seem like we're getting anywhere. 
And Paul again is saying, well, remember there's three, three specific apps we need to be all kind of working together. And look, notice Luke chapter 18. Or I'm sorry, uh, Matthew chapter 17. I'm wrong passage. Matthew chapter 17. In Matthew chapter 17 and verse 14 says, When they came to the crowd, a man came up to Jesus, falling on his knees before him and saying, Lord, have mercy on my son, for he is a lunatic and is very ill. For he often falls into the fire and often into the water. I brought him to your disciples and they could not cure him. And Jesus answered and said, You unbelieving and perverted generation, how long shall I be with you? How long shall I put up with you? Bring him here to me. And Jesus rebuked him, and the demon came out of him, and the boy was cured at once. Then the disciples came to Jesus privately and said, Why could we not drive it out? And he said to them, Because of the littleness of your faith. For truly I say to you, If you have faith the size of a mustard seed, you will say to this mountain, Move from here to there, and it will move. And nothing will be impossible to you. Sounds a lot like the passage we just read in Philippians. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Well, here's Jesus. His power is there, but yet they're failing. How? What? What's the problem? They're engaging. They have apparently some amount of faith. He says it's a little faith. They need to rely on genuine faith. And how is it they rely and engage this genuine faith? How does it work practically for them? Verse 21. But this kind does not go out except... By prayer and fasting. And what is fasting? Pondering. What is fasting? Depriving yourself of certain sensory uh, enjoyments so that you might solely focus entirely and give yourself over to thinking about the exalted things of God. That's the practical uh, power of those apps. That's why they fail. And many times that's the reason why you and I fail. We're told that there's, there's these mountains, nothing's impossible for God. We get in a hurry. We get in a hurry and we're often in that hurry because, of course, we're very anxious for that problem to be resolved as fast as possible. But if we would slow down, pause for these moments, and as we go to God in prayer, pray specifically, especially thinking about His past accomplishments, before we even think about what it is we want Him to do right now, we need to dwell, we need to reflect, we need to praise, we need to exalt, because all this is then fueling that practical faith when we engage it. And then we're able to see much better results. Just one more time, let's go back uh, uh, to Philippians very quickly. I just want to read here the end of uh, some of the statements He makes. It begins comforting and encouraging those to do this on a regular basis. In Philippians chapter 4, as we read the end of this here, verse uh, 13. Verse 13, I can do all things through Him who strengthens me. Nevertheless, you have done well to share with me in my affliction. You yourselves also know, Philippians, that the first preaching of the gospel after I left Macedonia, no church shared with me in the matter of giving and receiving, but you alone. For even in Thessalonica you sent a gift more than once for my need, not that I seek the gift itself, but I seek for the profit which increases to your account. But I have received everything in full and have an abundance. I am amply supplied, having received from Epaphroditus what you have sent, a fragrant aroma, an acceptable sacrifice, well-pleasing to God. You know what I love about this? is Paul is actually doing what he just told his audience to do themselves. He is reflecting. He is exalting God for the good things that he has done, that they have done in the past. Because Paul has a long road ahead of him. Paul has a lot of uncertainties. Paul has certain death, possible pain and affliction constantly awaiting him. I cannot imagine. And Paul is showing his audience, this is precisely how I get through all of my days. I get through them by prayer, pondering, and practicing. Jesus taught us to do this, to rely upon these things. So he reflects 
reflects on previous times when God used them and God allowed their love and their service to be a blessing to Him. And that's what He says there in verse 18, But I have received everything in full and have an abundance. I am amply supplied, having received from Epaphroditus what you have sent, a fragrant aroma, an acceptable sacrifice, well-pleasing to God. And verse 19, And my God will supply all your needs according to His riches and glory in Christ Jesus. Now to our God and Father, here's the praise. Be the glory forever and ever. Amen. Let the praise part of your prayer be a major, major part of getting through that obstacle. But how many times we our prayers become almost complaining sessions full of doubt. God, where are you? Will you? Paul is showing them if you would remember what Jesus constantly taught, perhaps more than any other practical lesson to his disciples for the three years he ministered with them, was I taught you to at all times always pray about everything and show them that there needs to be a certain kind of prayer, prayer with fasting or pondering or dwelling, <coughs> meditating. And don't forget that important piece that we magnify Him, we glorify Him, and in this we gain confidence, we trust Him, and now we're ready to engage and we're ready to practice. So in verse 21, he says, Greet every saint in Christ Jesus. The brethren who are with me greet you. All the saints greet you, especially those of Caesar's household. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ be with your spirit. So we just wanted to offer some practical points of encouragement encouragement that Paul uses at the end of this great letter and remind ourselves that we have access to God through prayer but let us pray as Paul teaches us specifically with thanksgiving with our supplications pondering on all the glorious achievements of our God praising him in honor and thanking him and then allowing our minds and our faith to be fully strengthened and ready to then tackle the problem if anyone is here is never obeyed the gospel of Jesus Christ. What a great problem certainly is in your life. But that does not have to remain the case. You have been given a great gift, a great invitation. Jesus, who loved you, who went to the cross, lived a perfect, sinless life, never guilt, guilty of one single fault, offered himself as a sacrifice, and allow our sufferings, the things that we deserve to fall upon Him. I want to go back to 2 Corinthians chapter 5. We looked at this uh, passage this morning. I want to see how it kind of fills out the end of the chapter. Remember it says in 2 Corinthians chapter 5 verse 14, about the practical way that our salvation is really about faith and about what it is that faith inspires us to do and to dwell on ultimately is about the love of Jesus. There in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, and verse 14, he says, For the love of Christ controls us, having concluded this, that one died for all, therefore all died. And he died for all, so that they who live might no longer live for themselves, but for him who died and rose again on their behalf. And then again, so practically, well, what does this mean? What does this mean? What, what is it about the love of Christ that compels others to surrender to his power and surrender to his blood and to act by faith and receive this great gift of forgiveness? Go down a little bit farther and read verse 17. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creature. The old things passed away. Behold, new things have come. Now all these things are from God who reconciled us to Himself through God or through Christ and give us the ministry of reconciliation, namely that God was in Christ reconciling the world to Himself, not counting their trespasses against them. And He has committed to us the word of reconciliation. So in verse 20 it says, Therefore we are ambassadors for Christ as though God were making an appeal through us. We beg you, on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God. In other words, if, if we truly allow our minds to sink in on this concept, as we looked at that sinful woman in our, our passage this morning, as her as a great example of really looking at the mercies that God is offering to us, we are totally undeserved, overwhelmed by them. 
is that we are able to be brand new and transformed and reconciled specifically in what way? Verse 21. He made him who knew no sin to be sin on our behalf so that we might become the righteousness of God in him. He knew no sin. We're all too familiar with. As much as we move away from it, we still often have the taste of it in our mouth and still try ourselves the best we can to be totally transformed and changed. And here's one who knew no sin, absolutely none of it, and yet allowed himself to be sin for us, to take the consequences and the guilt, have it beaten upon him, as he's nailed to a cross, that love ought to compel us to respond in love, ultimately through faith. It allows this great gift that if you confess Jesus as the Christ, the Son of the living God, and by faith give yourself up, die to that selfish life of self-fulfilling desires and sin, and die to surrender to being led by Christ, do that in baptism, repenting, being buried and re being risen to walk in newness of life. And if anyone needs to do that, we encourage you. Won't you come to the front? We we'll encourage you and stand and sing this song that you might come and obey the gospel while we sing.